evenings, everybody. It's good to see you again. Um, now the eighth of our town hall series. I can't believe there's already been eight of these. We'll have one more later in the year, which I'll tell you all about. Uh, and I want to start off by uh, wishing everybody a happy Thanksgiving season next week. We're going to be talking uh, in a bit about some safe approaches to the holidays as, as they come up. I want to thank uh, Huntley and Dan Kubitza, who are uh, coming towards the end of their two-year stint of heading our Society for Leading Medicine, and thank them both for all of their tremendous work and all the members of our society. For any of you who are not members of, of our society, there will be an email at the end of the presentation if you'd like more information about joining the Society for Leading Medicine. I'd like to also thank our Cancer Center Council. And they are uh, hosts of this event today, chaired by Dorothy Abels as well as uh, our members of the Sherry and Alan Conover Center for Liver Disease and Transplantation Task Force, uh, led by Paula Creel. And uh, thank you to both of those groups and all the membership for hosting today. And you'll, you'll hear from a couple of our great leaders from each of those centers in a few moments. You know, last time we had Dr. Ashley Drews, who heads up infectious disease across our system and who's played such a pivotal role during COVID uh, on the live chat through this. And it proved to be so successful in answering your questions uh, along the way that Dr. Drews uh, has graciously agreed to be with us in the live chat again. So keep firing those questions to Dr. Drews and she'll be happy to answer them. Uh, Dirk Sossman is taking a, a nice break. I'm delighted he's got a little vacation time. So I'll speak about both COVID and, and try to pinch hit for him as we talk about some of the vaccines and vaccine logistics. Dr. David Bernard, who is the medical director of clinical pathology at Houston Methodist, who's really been pivotal in our response around testing from the beginning. I'm really one of the rock stars of this response. will be speaking to us a little later. Dr. Jenny Chang, who you all have seen before, the Emily Herman Chair for Cancer Research and the director of our Houston Methodist Cancer Center, will be talking about COVID and cancer patients. And then first, we're going to start with Dr. Mark Gobriel, uh, who uh, heads up, the, who recently promoted, actually, to the head of the J.C. Walter Jr. Uh, Transplant Center. We're proud of you, Dr. Gobriel, and congratulations. He holds the Sherry and Alan Conover Chair for Excellence in Liver Transplantation. And he's going to talk about really the unique challenges of COVID and what that presents within a, patient, a, a population of patients with severe end organ failure and transplantation. Dr. Gobriel, thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, this is an incredible introduction, Mark, and uh, I mean, I just want to thank everybody who's listening uh, to, the, um, to, to this presentation for all the efforts that they put in. Um, my task today was to, to try to answer some of the questions, and um, I'm just going to put them up. These are the questions uh, we received, and um, this, they all center around the, uh, the transplant event. Uh, how do the transplant patients uh, respond to that? Uh, is it organ-dependent? Um, are there any more patients impacted uh, more than others? Um, and uh, are we seeing more transplant patients admitted because of COVID? There were other two questions. Um, can, uh, can somebody who's had a COVID infection be a donor? And uh, what are we doing for the at-risk population when the vaccine is, uh, uh, come, finally uh, is approved? And to try to answer this, I want to just give you a couple of minutes about the scope of the transplant patients and who they are and how do we deal with them. First, let me say thank you to uh, Dr. Gaber, who has become the chair of the Department of Surgery. And, I, uh, and he left me with a huge transplant center. So he has uh, big shoes to fill. Um, and hopefully I can do that successfully. So the, the, the transplant is, uh, the Methodist Transplant Center is the center of a lot of activities that, you know, liver, heart, lung, pancreas, kidney, uh, and also there's a lot of pre-transplant patients who are a part of that uh, 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 transplant center. So it's not only the, the patients who are, have gotten a transplant, but the patients who are waiting for a transplant as well, as well as the patients that we have accumulated over time. Many of the patients want to stay within the transplant center after they get their transplant. So this is, uh, to give you an idea of the, uh, this is the heat map of the uh, referrals and the patients that we take care of and really spans patients out from Louisiana way into Texas and, and up in the north of the state. So that is a large population. How large the population? These are numbers of the transplants that have been performed. Um, and uh, to start, we started uh, 10 years ago, but 174 total number of transplants performed at, at the Methodist. And uh, this year, we're on track to do over 550, close to 570 transplants. That includes heart, lung, liver, uh, kidney, and pancreas as well. 
So, and what does that mean? So when we talk about more than 500 transplants, and I tried to list the, uh, the centers, now, not every hospital in the country is able to provide services for different uh, 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 organs. So some may have a kidney liver program, others may have uh, a dominant heart and dominant liver. So of the, trans of the centers that offer all four transplants, um, Houston Methodist is right here and it ranks third in the country. And that is, um, you know, that is an incredible achievement. And we're not very far from the number two position. So where do we start? We have, we get about, this starts from the referrals. We get about 5,500 yearly referrals. And that number is increasing. It's about, you know, 15% over last year. Of those patients that are referred to us, these are taking care, these patients are, taking, are being taken care of in our different centers, the liver center, the heart center. Then some of them are, do get evaluated of those, and then they get presented in the medical review board, and then there are new listings, and then we end up with doing the transplants. So you can see the pyramid is, in a, the inverted pyramid, to end up, we end up with about 687 uh, procedures performed. These include transplants, uh, live donations, and also VADs, uh, ventricular assist devices. So that gives us the scope of the patients that we are taking care of, and they're different patients, liver and heart, Patients are a little different from the kidney and so forth. So what did the transplant center do? We came up with a COVID transplant task force that is meeting at least once or twice a week. There were several CMS guidelines to how we respond to that. And CMS wanted us to divide the patients or uh, who is very critical, cannot wait and has to be transplanted to the patients who can wait. So for a very small period, we suspended the, um, the, the living donor kidney program because we were worried about the COVID infections to, uh, to the donors and to the potential recipients. However, many other patients who are waiting for a transplant has a very high, have very high mortality rates that far exceeds the mortality rate that we see uh, with the COVID infections. And because of that, we continue with transplantations for the critically ill patients across all organs. So we saw a brief um, uh, period where we, we were kind of slow, but, but then uh, two months into the COVID uh, 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 pandemic, we, we saw a very rapid increase in the number of the transplantations that we are doing. Um, a lot of patients who were um, locked in a, in a lock mode uh, became very sick, and we ended up by getting a lot of patients who were uh, much sicker than usual. Uh, however, we started looking into uh, what guidelines do we, do we use for the patients. So we have very strict guidelines for the patients who get transplanted um, for you know, how much, you know, uh, what, what exposure do they have and so forth. And we structured the COVID clinic for all those patients. So these are the numbers. Um, the patients who were tested at the beginning, it's getting more. So to date, we have tested um, over 1,500 patients, and these are patients who develop symptoms. Of those tested, about 12.3% 12 12 are positive. And of those positive patients, 24% did not make it or passed away or died. So try to, uh, to put that into perspective again. Um, of the numbers of the patients who were tested, 12.5% uh, were positive. And those we, we tried to figure out is the infection more severe right before transplant, three years after transplant? Uh, how, you know, what, is there a period when we have to be very careful? Um, and of those patients, there, 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 they, there were several patients who were positive, whether less than one year or greater. Than, or, or greater. Um, so the positivity rate you know, is, is about 12.5% of the patients who get transplanted will end up by having a COVID infection of those tested. And it is, it is evenly distributed amongst organs and it is evenly distributed throughout the periods after the transplant, whether in the first year or later on. So the COVID-19 positive tests by organ, there was 94 kidneys, 27 livers, but remember there's more kidneys than livers. So the percent of patients who are affected in every organ is approximately the same. Now the same also the mortality of the patients, the positivity of mortality is about 12 kidney patients who passed away and liver, four liver, five lung, one heart. So again, it is um, because we have more kidneys than we have more patients who passed away. So the, 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 the deaths are equivalent um, amongst all organs. 
So the question here, how does that relate to the, uh, to the general population or is, is, that, is this population more risky or more susceptible than usual? So if you look, then, and I got those numbers, they may not be up to the minute updated. However, in the United States, there's been 11 million cases with about 248 deaths. For the percent of deaths is about 2.2, 2.5% in the United States for all comers. If we look at the transplant population in the Methodist Hospital or the Methodist Enterprise, uh, there were uh, 188 cases that were positive out of 1,500 tested. The numbers are small, but nevertheless, this is what we have. And 24 deaths, that gives us about 12.3% mortality. So the transplant patients have got a 12.3% mortality compared to about 2.2% or 2.5% of the general population. So this population of patients um, uh, seems to be much more susceptible than the rest of the population. So the other two, I hope that that answered the first two questions. Uh, now, the, can the COVID survivors uh, be organ donors? We do not know the answer to that question. However, um, in one or two cases, we had organs given up, uh, uh, coming to us from donors who tested positive, I'm sorry, who tested negative initially. And after the organs are transplanted, we, we get, oh, oops, we, we repeated the test and um, uh, there, is, um, uh, there is one positive test. So this is not very clear whether that, that is that a false positive or a false negative. So we had one or two events of that uh, uh, and the recipients did not suffer. So I expect that in the future, we should be able to sort this out based on the antibodies that are present in the donor. We have some criteria. Uh, will at the risk population, uh, such as the transplant patients, have early access to COVID? I think uh, 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 Dr. Boom is gonna answer to that, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's gonna be uh, a definite yes. Uh, and I think with that, uh, hopefully I've answered all the uh, initial four questions that I've received. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Gobriel. Um, appreciate you and everything that, that you and your team do. Um, really a remarkable transplant program. So and congratulations again. We're delighted to have you in your new thank role. Thank you, Mark. Well, we're gonna turn things over to Dr. Chang now, who is going to talk to us about COVID and cancer patients. Okay, so I'm gonna give a brief overview about COVID and cancer patients. Well, COVID and cancer, Unfortunately, as we all know, uh, this virus hit us in March, and at that point, um, nothing was known about it. Then there came a flurry of papers, basically, the very first coming out of Wuhan, especially looking at COVID in cancer patients. The Wuhan paper, which was published in a very good journal, basically was had facts like or facts or data like, you know, if you had cancer, any form of cancer, you were three times more likely to succumb to, to, to COVID. And soon after that, another paper was published, again in Lancet, uh, by a large uh, consortium um, uh, looking at COVID patients in cancer. And this paper basically was published in the May, May time. And uh, this task force basically tried to look at what the burden was uh, if you had cancer and, um, and you got infected with COVID. By and large, the data, again, this again is a new virus, and this is data in May, showed that if there are certain risk factors, like your age, if you're older, if you were male, if you smoked, and if you had comorbid conditions, you were not as healthy, and if you had active cancer, these were all risk factors to you developing um, a, a more severe form of COVID. Now, I want to say again, this paper was published in May. Uh, since then, uh, data has been coming out and we have a cumulative experience here in Houston Methodist. And I would like to go through some of this and some of the things that we are doing about this. Obviously, uh, setting the time clock back now in about May, uh, March, we were very concerned about this. So we did several things immediately. We tried to use all our understanding of what caused um, this severe form of cancer. And we've all heard about now the cytokine storm, which is the virus, basically your body reacts to this novel virus in a way in which it's trying to overcome and overcompensate for this virus. And this releases inflammatory markers into the bloodstream, which then overcompensates and attacks good organs like your lung, your kidneys, your vasculature, your, your vessels, etc. And this is what we believe leads to um, the demise of a patient. Because we knew this, and this is something we see in the uh, uh, transplantation, not, uh, not organ transplantation, but uh, for BMT and for CAR T cells. We see this, and so we basically use our, our basically resources, our in, in 
try to try to understand this. And we've done a lot of work in this area. The first thing we did was, okay, across the bat, let's, let's measure what kind of inflammatory markers are being released in the bloodstream. And so here you see, we, we were able to measure 40 different types of markers just from a blood draw. And there's this huge surge on the table on the right in these inflammatory cytokines in blood in patients who were exposed to COVID infections. But that's not enough. Let's try and figure out who is it that gets sick and who are, who, who are the people who basically can go home with you know, feeling miserable for about two weeks. So what we did is this really elaborate called CYTOF analysis, where we can take your blood and we can separate out the different components of your blood. So your blood has obviously, you know, your red cells, your white cells, your platelets. Now within your white cells, there are multiple different types of white cells. And we are beginning to understand what's happening here. The top row are patients who have been intubated, so they're sick. The bottom row are patients who are infected, who are not sick, they're discharged. What you're seeing here now, the, on day eight, where you see the orange blob, that is your T cells. And you see the intubated patient has less T cells. So what's happening here is you have exhausted T, shell, T cells, you're unable to fight the virus and you get intubated, okay? Now look at the bottom row. You see now the uh, brownie kind of thing. And that is uh, compared to one on top. You see less brown on the bottom right-hand corner. Well, those are your inflammatory, your myeloid cells that pro provides this inflammatory response. The intubated patient has a lot of these inflammatory cells being kicked out and exhausted T cells. So this is what we're dealing with. Your T cells, which is what you need to kill the virus, uh, is exhausted. But you're kicking out these inflammatory cells, which are just causing the cytokine cascade that's causing your body to react to this. And this is the data that we have had. We've analyzed about, um, I would like to say about 20 patients. And this is clear trend um, about this. So based on this sort of stuff, we are actually figuring out ways in which when we intervene with suppressing your immune system, this is a very complicated, multiple pathways are involved here. And I would like to draw your attention to the, again, bottom right, it always seems to be bottom right. And we believe that the main cytokines that drive um, this inflammatory cascade is IL-6 uh, into uh, IL-1A and T uh, interferon gamma. So basically, based on this, again here, you can see there are drugs that are out there. Tocilizumab is a drug that we give for rheumatoid autoimmune disorders, and we can attack IL-6 from there. And, and the Kindra is another drug we can give for interleukin-1. Uh, our interferons can be by rheumatoid drugs like infleximab. And so we actually have an ongoing study that combines all of this to help patients prevent them from getting very, very sick. But all this is very elaborate and difficult. And there are other ways, using the transplant world, the solid transplant world, where we have mesenchymal stem cells. We can take your bone marrow, we can isolate your mesenchymal stem cells, we can replenish your bone marrow uh, with, with, with these uh, things that basically will suppress your immune system. So all these things are ongoing. And what I wanted to say is that we are in one of the weirdest times in, in my estimation. We have, unfortunately, uh, hitting a quarter of a million people dead in this country. I think this is something we never could imagine. Um, but what is very, very important too is, and what I would like to emphasize, is cancer basically goes on. Uh, we need to take care of our patients in a safe way, um, respecting, being very respectful of um, the huge cost to humanity with this virus. So while we strongly encourage, and we will keep you as safe as possible, that we know how to humanly possible. And from the start of this COVID infection, what we did was we did every measure to keep patients away from us if they were, could safely be done. Uh, Dr. Garcourt basically on March 1st, whatever, when they first started, within the first six weeks, we basically collected all the data as to who could use telemedicine why we could use telemedicine, and what were the barriers for people for using telemedicine so that we could keep it out of our hospitals if we could. And this is published in uh, a JCO affiliate journal, which is one of our top journals. Additionally, like I said, back in May, the data we said that all these people were higher risk, whether you're male, if you're a smoker, etc. What we're seeing in our patients with cancer is we're not necessarily seeing the same trends in all solid tumors. I think if you have a hematologic disorder, cancer, you are at definitely higher risk. 
But I can say that we have treated 50 patients with breast cancer with COVID infections. We are not seeing this severity that is being described. So we are part of this consortium. We are gathering data. And again, I want to emphasize, while being very, very respectful of this uh, virus and doing everything that we can to keep you safe, I strongly encourage that everybody continues with your screenings, continues with, continue with your regular medical checkup, because cancer is not going to go away and delaying by six months or more uh, will not be to your advantage. Thank you. Yes, I, well, these are the people, everybody on the team, the cancer center people, and frankly, all our frontline physicians, nurses, care, and for our patients. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Chang. So, so if I hear you correctly, and I think about Dr. Gobriel as well, so tra transplant patients out in the community, you know, lifelong immunosuppression, Very we different. know they're at higher risk because they're on immunosuppression, and that's what we've seen there. What you're saying is hematologic malignancy patients. Oh, sure. I mean, if you think about that, that's actually the, the system that's supposed to fight Correct. the disease, and it's already not working because of the hematologic Correct. malignancy. But perhaps people For like breast, a breast cancer, GI, unless even, even in treatment, you're saying. So yes. even the outpatient is in the midst of no. some treatment. It's not no. as immunosuppressive, perhaps, Correct. and not giving the Correct. same risk. And it's a, different, it's a different part of your immune system that's affected by chemotherapy. Now, I want to say, again, there are lots of caveats to this. I, from what, again, anecdotally, lung cancer, again, is the organ, right? Uh, we're not having good results with that. So we are being very mindful yeah. of what to do. So smokers, smoking is a risk factor. Right. So you already have damaged lungs. Um, mm -hmm. So we're not, for lung cancer, yes. For breast cancer, yeah, we, we are mindful. We, we just get on with it because you need to get your treatment. You need to get your treatment. <laughs> That's it. And so, we, so, I mean, a couple key points. One, of course, is we can't stop caring for patients with other diseases in the COVID. We've made that point over and over again. But the other really is that we as a population have to protect those individuals. And oftentimes we don't even know who they are, right? I mean, I've, I've chatted with people many times. I mean, I still remember talking to one person. I saw, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. You look well. And they said, well, you know, nine months ago, I had my liver transplant at Methodist. Yeah. This is true. And, and, and uh, um, it, it's remarkable what we do. But those individuals, even when we don't realize it, are at risk. So it's our duty, I think, all of Absolutely. us to protect them. So. Well, thank you, Dr. Chang. I, I will say that Dr. Chang, uh, very early on, she and her team were, you know, some of the people banging the, the drum, really leading much of the national thought on how we manipulate the immune system and the cytokine storm and other things. And she's led many of these trials uh, internally at Houston Methodist and um, really the best and the, the brightest care that we have here at Houston Methodist. Um, all right, well, we're gonna move on to Dr. David Bernard. Dr. David Bernard, uh, as I said, uh, heads up uh, our clinical lab here. Uh, he and his team really are responsible for the fact that we had a test up and running, ready to go the day things hit, hit uh, the ground and um, uh, countless tests have been performed. He'll, I'm sure, talk about some of that today. Dr. Bernard. All right. Thanks, uh, Dr. Boom. Um, it's an honor to be here and, and uh, hopefully we'll get through some of this if I can figure out the electronics. So um, we're talking about COVID testing and I like to use this very simple cartoon. It, uh, here and what you can see is that's the culprit, that's the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and um, it has a it's an RNA virus. So the little circ the squiggle in the middle is the depiction of the RNA, and then it has on top of the RNA some proteins, uh, nucleo um, capsid protein that helps to stabilize and and um, will be mentioned a little bit later. Uh, and then it has an envelope, which uh, gratefully makes it a little less uh, hardy in the environment. And then, as you can see, it's attaching to the cell through the um, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme receptor. And it's using what's known as the spike protein because it looks like a spike. And you can see it's a coronavirus because it looks like it's got a, uh, a crown around it and our corona. So um, that's the, the culprit. And then um, in the laboratory, we need to figure out uh, how we detect infections in individuals. And there are right now three different um, things that we look at. First is the detection of the viral RNA, and I'll talk a lot about that. Then the detection of the viral proteins, which uh, also is called uh, antigen testing. And then we'll touch on the uh, immune response. Uh, this is the production of antibodies and also um, T cell immunity uh, in post either post-infection or 
uh, post um, uh, post vaccination. So, in the you can use a number of different types of samples. There are a couple of questions about different types of samples. The virus infects a lot of different cells. It's mostly respiratory that are easily uh, seen and have high concentrations that we can detect. Um, and the two that we use mostly at Methodist and, and most other people use are nasopharyngeal swabs. So that's where you stick a swab um, through the nose uh, into the back passage of the, the uh, pharynx and get a sample there. And then also you, we also use the anterior nares. So the, the uh, front of the nose where you can get a, 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 a tissue into uh, also swab there. Other, tish, other samples are shown. One that we are investigating but not using yet here at Methodist that some people are using for uh, high volume uh, testing of uh, like college students is saliva. Um, there are some differences and we used to think in the beginning that there were discrepancies between a sputum sample and a nasopharyngeal or an oropharyngeal sample. And I think our uh, understanding has evolved. The, the different epithelia and uh, cells that are in different locations in the respiratory tract have different receptor density expression, and therefore they have different uh, amounts of viruses. And perhaps even individuals have difference, uh, differences uh, amongst different um, samples. So, you know, the discrepancy, I'm not really sure, but there are differences. So in the clinical laboratory, uh, most of the time we use FDA approved tests. And the FDA goes through a significant process of validating the, the, the or reviewing the data that uh, companies and organization have used to uh, validate that the test actually does what, it's, uh, what they uh, say it does. And um, just for COVID, there are no FDA approved tests. So that leaves two other avenues for tests. Um, one is a laboratory developed test. So high complexity laboratories such as ours can develop a test that they can only use at that site. You can't market it to other sites. Early on, as Dr. Booms um, mentioned, we had an LDT that, that was um, put up very early. Um, and then there is a, another process called an emergency use authorization. The FDA during um, periods of uh, emergencies uh, had the authority to review in an expeditious fashion um, uh, tests and to allow them to then be marketed to multiple different places. Um, at Methodist, at currently we only use uh, EUA uh, and commercially available assays at the moment. So getting back, we're, that's the virus. You'll see that again. I like that picture. This is a, a stylized picture of uh, a nucleic acid amplification. This is the mainstay of what we do. It's the only testing that we do at this point. Basically, you can see here someone's getting a sample drawn. Uh, the RNA is, uh, t uh, is uh, uh, taken. It's extracted. There's a process to make DNA from it, reverse transcriptase. And then there is a uh, amplification of one makes two makes four and so on. And these are all automated now. And there is a probe that every time you make a copy, uh, it generates a little tiny bit of probe, a little tiny bit of probes, not much until it gets to be a lot. And that crosses a threshold and the sample becomes positive. A negative is over here where there's no crossing of the threshold. So um, that's what we typically do in the laboratory and um, all these assays that we're doing are now automated except for one, uh, which requires a little bit of intervention. But the, the machine will do the test and will tell you whether the result is positive or negative. So um, uh, as I said, we use multiple different platforms. They're all concordant in our laboratory. And what I mean by that is if you give us a sample, if we take an MP sample and test it on one type of uh, instrument uh, and it's positive, if we test it on all the other types of instruments, it'll be positive. And if it's negative on one type, it'll be negative on the others. So that allows us to, um, even with a multitude of different types of assays to do 
uh, expanded numbers of tests per day. Our fastest test is 75 minutes. Um, that's a, it's called a Cepheid, and the reagents are uh, incredibly limited um, by allocation, and um, we can only offer that service for uh, stat situations. Wish we could do everyone's that way, but we can't. Our average turnaround time is, is excellent. It's 5.4 hours over the last seven days. That's from the time of receipt in the laboratory to the time with your result is in my chart. And um, that's very good. And we do multiple different types of specimens. Um, as Dr. Boom said, we've done a lot of these, 262,000 as of um, a couple days ago, uh, 20, almost 28,000 positives as of a couple days ago. Our rate cumulatively over time is 10%. And if you look at the numbers in Texas, we've done, we have identified 2.5% of the total positives in Texas. And right now we have a maximum of about 7,500 a day we could do. We are trying to increase that all the time up to a goal that was given to me many months ago of 10,000. Um, I, I, my presence is still tolerated, although I haven't reached goal. <laughs> um, uh, going back to the virus. So that's the nucleic acid. Let's talk a little bit about antigens. There are seven antigen tests or protein detection tests that have been approved. Um, all of them um, uh, detect the nucleic acid, uh, nucleic acid nu mm, nucleic acid protein, except for one, which is, was just approved recently, um, that looks at the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. Um, they, two, except for two of them, they all require an instrument to read them, and they're shown here. Um, interesting, the one that made the biggest splash, I think, was the, the Binox now, and that is with the first 150 million tests were purchased by the federal government, and they get to use them, and, and uh, uh, we won't. Um, the antigen tests are, when you compare antigen to nucleic acid in our hands, um, uh, I'll show you the data, but the FDA uh, acknowledges in their, um, uh, when they release these tests or approve them with an EUA, there are uh, little caveats to it. So a negative test may not be a negative test um, for the BD now and the curse, uh, CARE start. Uh, all of their negatives are presumptive, which means you're supposed to do an RT-PCR test uh, to rule it out. And then others are time limited. If you get it early enough uh, following post-exposure or onset of symptoms, a negative would be negative. But uh, if you miss your window, you have to do an RT-PCR. And then a positive result, I think, has gotten the most press recently. A positive result, there has been uh, a identification of an increased number of false positives in, um, uh, in, with the use of antigen tests. Uh, so much so that the FDA issued a warning letter um, on uh, the 3rd of November this year identifying that false positives occur, um, that they highlighted areas of concern. You have to really be strictly adhering to the manufacturer's instructions, which have been approved by the FDA, and um, really need to correlate the clinical symptoms with um, uh, the test results, especially in long-term care facilities. So uh, we've evaluated a lot of these. We compare them in a, a very standard way. We do our, our index test, and then we look at uh, the comparative test. And if you look at 100 positives, and this is just normalized to 100, uh, so there are 100 positives that are um, positive by an RT-PCR method at Houston Methods, one of our seven methods. 63 of those, if you did a nasal swab, will be positive um, via that RT-PCR method. We evaluated the Abbott ID now and the uh, Quidel Sophia and several other antigens, and you drop off from 50% um, down to 40s or below. Um, we've had good uh, correlation with negative results. So right now, we only do two tests. We do the uh, nasopharyngeal, and we also, in low positivity rate populations, we do RT-PCR, uh, but we continue to look for other methods. 
uh, just flu season. There are combo tests that are out there. Uh, is it COVID? Is it flu? Pre-test probability right now, it's COVID. There have been only 18 uh, cases of influenza A, influenza B uh, in our laboratory diagnosed in uh, since September 15th. Two weeks ago, um, checked it and it was um, 14 cases. So it's not going up. Um, so, and you can follow that at our uh, website. So again, um, we talked about the, the RNA, we talked about the, the uh, antigen tests, just briefly the antibodies. This is gonna, going to become very important as we go on, but this is just a, a representation of, you get in red, you get the, the, an infection. This is all kinetics post-infection and it's idealized. It's not, the individuals may vary, but then there are three different types of antibodies that are usually uh, detected. IgM, which often comes first, IgG and IgM. IgG um, persists, uh, IgM apparently, you know, uh, not apparently, it usually goes away. Um, it's not for acute diagnosis. Um, it can demonstrate previous de infection if you've had the antibodies. Um, it uh, will hopefully be used post-vaccination soon, and it helps to qualify convalescent plasma that it should be effective. And post-vaccination, um, will, you know, I think everybody, once they get their vaccine, will want to know what their status is, and they will uh, undoubtedly want a quantitative level. They'll correlate with, uh, hopefully, immunity. We'll have a test available at Houston Methodist. And then for those who don't mount an antibody response, the... Um, one of the questions is, how do you look for them? In some of the early studies, a lot of the uh, people that were vaccinated were still immune, um, but they had their immunity based in T cell response. And we're looking at ways to um, reliably and in a scalable mm -hmm. fashion test for that. So my thanks go especially to Dr. Musser, who's a visionary, who was the first guy who got these. They said, hey, we need to test the team, and then Dr. Boom and his team has been just incredibly graceful and uh, provide leadership and resources. It's just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Bernard. I, I, I like to joke that Dr. Bernard was my most expensive physician across the across Houston Methodist this year because um, either my email or my phone would ring and he, we'd need another piece of equipment, but we got him. And yes, uh, uh, as he said, we have uh, dramatic testing capacity now at Houston Methodist and, and still increasing. Um, we've thankfully never had to quite use all of that capacity bumping up there, uh, but uh, we want to be ready for every eventuality. Uh, and y'all have done a remarkable job. So um, thank you very much. You know, I, I take a couple things out of that. You know, one really good thing is uh, doesn't change that we should all get our flu shots. And in fact, part of this is we are getting our flu shots, but we're not seeing the flu, um, which is the same thing we saw in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, the flu actually will more easily respond to all of the things we're doing from hand washing to, yeah. to masking and everything else. Um, certainly raises some interesting questions about what we might want to do as a society in the future, um, particularly for people who know they have the flu or have upper respiratory illnesses. There are probably some good ways to protect others. Um, another is really that you know PCR is still the gold standard and much as we don't love it, I've had it done uh, several times now. When you get the uh, PCR test in the nasopharynx or in the back, it, it burns a little bit. Uh, it is the gold standard, mm -hmm. um, and in, so we we use the nasopharynge or I'm sorry, the nasal part just where it's in the nose, it's a little less uncomfortable. Um, sometimes in low prevalence situations when you're just screening and screening frequently, it works. Um, but I don't put a whole lot of stock still, I gotta be honest, in all those antigen tests. I get a lot right. of patients call me personally and I always tell them, let's get you a PCR first um, and, and, and then sort things out. So, I agree. Um, and I know Dr. Bernard agrees, he's taught me all of that. So. So um, with that, I'm gonna talk about kind of the situation uh, on the ground in Houston, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, where we are with vaccines, because we're in a very, um, you know, sort of strange time in the US. I mean, it, right now, on one hand, um, I think things are gonna get as difficult as they've gotten, certainly across the United States, and in many places they already are. Um, but on the flip side of that, we have the best hope we have had since the beginning of this crisis. What we've been telling you for months um, and hoping for months um, you know, is, is appearing to come true. And uh, we're thrilled with that. And actually, I think there's some definite light at the tunnel, end of the tunnel. So as difficult as some of this is, there's a lot of hope out there. And I really think we are well over the hump 
overall in terms of time, uh, in terms of the significant disruption COVID has caused, and, and really starting to see an ability to get to the other end of this uh, whole situation, which is obviously uh, ultimately going to be a blessing. And I think the latter half of 2021 hopefully should be a heck of a lot better than this horrible year of 2020. So let's talk about what's going on in the United States. Um, this is the curve of cases in the United States, and it is uh, honestly jaw-dropping. Um, you know, we had that surge in the, in the spring uh, that was very, uh, uh, you know, jumped upon, and uh, obviously, particularly certain parts of the country, we'll talk about that a little more. Then, of course, we, <laughs> we were largely responsible for that second curve, along with some other southern states. Uh, but now, really, we are, you know, shooting up way higher. And while some of this is the result of more access to testing, for sure, um, that is not the explanation of why we are seeing this many tests. Now, the the good news so far, and I emphasize so far, is the mortality data, you know, has not reached those kinds of heights. So we saw horrendous mortality, uh, particularly in New York and a couple other markets back in that first phase. Um, a big surge in mortality, certainly the next time. But of course, as you look at the, the relative proportions on these two graphs, clearly a much lower mortality rate during that time. Uh, and of course, that right hand side of the curve is not coming up nearly as quickly as the other piece. So that's good news. But let me qualify the good news. Um, I've shown you data before. When we look at the Texas Medical Center across the board, our data, it takes 33 days for 90% of the deaths to occur from a single day of his admission. So in other words, if on October 1st, people are admitted, 90% of any of those who might die who were admitted on October 1st die by like November 2nd, November 3rd. There's still a tail of another 10% after that. So there's a significant lag time in mortality. So this implies to me, we're going to see a, a much larger spike coming up in mortality across the US. I don't think it's at this point, knock wood and thank goodness, like the heights of that first curve, but pretty clearly it's gonna be quite a bit higher than what we saw this summer in terms of mortality. Those uh, mortality data were, you know, solidly in the 23, 2400 deaths a day back in the uh, uh, that that first curve, uh, and I think we may approach that. I'm hoping we don't go too much past that. But when you do the math on that, that 250,000 deaths that sadly have occurred and that Dr. Chang mentioned could very easily become five to 600,000 deaths before we get to this end of the tunnel, and we have it in our hands to try to prevent that um, from happening. This is the map in the United States right now in terms of hotspots. Very interesting, um, you know, when you look at this, and I'll show you another piece of data associated with that. So think about that first surge, right? The, you know, obviously New York, New Jersey, some of New England, uh, uh, Louisiana, and New Orleans, a little bit the West Coast, not quite as hot, but certainly the first cases, of course, up in uh, Oregon and Washington State and then California. Uh, the second surge was, you know, Arizona, Texas, uh, you know, Florida, uh, uh, Georgia, et cetera. Uh, and now it's really upper Midwest and it's rural areas. And so we're seeing this go to places it didn't go before. Now there's a whole host of questions about why that is. Personally, I think the biggest reason is that once we've had an ugly surge in a market, we tend to learn our lessons and more people come along. And what we're seeing in many of these markets is you know, behaviors that were not quite where they were with everyone else. It may not be the only thing. Certainly there's plausible potential that there's a particularly vulnerable part of the population that hasn't been hit yet, that there may be some cross immunity with other coronavirus strains. There may be some other mitigating factors and some of it could just be math of, if you haven't had many infections, there's more people susceptible, but none of us are even remotely near herd immunity. But nonetheless, the hotspots have really migrated but the problematic thing is how widespread they are and how with the rural areas starting, the urban areas are now starting to catch back up. And of course, much more population there and much more chance to see those numbers continue to spike. This is a very interesting study. Uh, it came out of Carnegie Mellon. And uh, I actually like this graphic that was in one of the, I think it's in the Washington Post, a little better than the original graphics, just a little uh, easier to, to read. But basically what you see on the y-axis is how many people say, hey, I know somebody with COVID and who has COVID symptoms in a state. And on the x-axis, you see increasing amounts of mask usage when that is studied and, and looked at. And it's a pretty dramatic uh, correlation. I mean, there's not many things in, in, in medicine that line up this well. Um, and clearly those states where we don't have widespread mask usage, 
are seeing higher upticks right now than states where we see more widespread mask usage. Um, we're seeing the same thing, honestly, anecdotally across Texas. I don't have data, but if you talk to people up in the panhandle, it's almost socially unacceptable for people to wear a mask many times and they're getting slammed by COVID. Um, in Houston, we still do a pretty darn good job at that. Not perfect, and I think we've started to, to let our guards down a little bit again, um, but we do an overall pretty good job. So this is Texas. And you all have obviously have seen the news. El Paso is really dramatic. Um, I spent, I've spent a good amount of time on the phone with colleagues there um, offering to help wherever we can. It's pretty tough from this far away. We, we can theoretically take transfers, but practically to do those that far out is not happening in, in huge numbers right now. Lots of nurses have gone and you know, uh, many, many people going in to help them. El Paso is about a tenth the size of Houston and yet they have uh, uh, more hospital patients in-house right now than Houston and Dallas combined. Um, so it is a pretty hairy situation there right now. Um, worse than our peak, not, not massively worse than our um, summer peak, but worse than our peak for sure. You see the panhandle in other areas. Interestingly, Dallas has ramped back up faster than Houston this time. Um, they didn't get hit as hard um, in the summer. They had a big peak, but when I talked to colleagues there, you know, for example, similar size system as ours, we peaked at 800 patients, they peaked in the mid 300s, uh, but they've now passed their peak from the summer. So they're already seeing bigger than their peak. And we'll talk about our data uh, in just a second. This is then four different graphs for Texas. In the upper left, you see the number of people diagnosed with COVID. So we actually, you know, with all those rural areas hitting and then the base of what's still happening in all the uh, urban markets, we have more people being diagnosed than ever before. Um, now we also have more testing than ever before, but clearly if you look at that graph, not at the same proportion, that's the bottom left. It doesn't explain all of this. In fact, our experience at Houston Methodist has been not that testing results in more more people being positive, but when we see more positivity, we have more demand for testing and we end up doing more tests. Um, so that's what we usually see. In the upper right, you see deaths in Texas. And I wanna uh, call to your attention, if you pay attention and look, can look closely, the left-hand peak, which is the number of cases, was you know mid-July. But that plateau you see in the upper right, which lasted about a month, goes all the way to mid-August. So very consistent with that Texas Medical Center data of about a 30-day lag. So unfortunately, a lot more deaths coming in the state of Texas. And similarly, at the bottom, you see the hospitalization peak lag the number of diagnoses by about a two to three week window. So I tell everybody, look, looking at these data, looking at the data I see in Houston, I can tell you with certainty, fair certainty, that we're gonna see a significant uptick for two to three weeks. I can't tell you after that because hopefully we can bring infections down, change, change how we're acting, but I can tell you we've got another two, three weeks at least of significant increase at Houston Methodist coming. This is TMC-wide data uh, where we take the positive cases for the greater Houston area. This comes from the state, as I've talked about before. It's still messy data. It's a little less messy. But you see in the orange color for uh, this past month of November, um, you can see in orange, those are the cases each day. The gray bar is the cases that uh, are reported from some previous period of time on that day. And they've, start, they've done that for a good couple of months, but they've never gone away. So in other words, what that says is there's a delay. So if you look at today's cases, they're being underreported in the orange. And in a couple of weeks, we'll see some of those cases. If you look at the bottom half of this, you can see the entire trend line. I think one of the lessons we've now learned based on the state's delays, the peak in July is very understated there. It was probably much higher. And then we reported or they reported a lot of the cases later. So I believe actually the uptick is probably on uh, from their data underreported right now. And we're going to see that continuing to sharpen going up. I put the most faith in my team, Dr. Bernard, uh, the people here and the data we have in real time. This is our testing trend. So in the blue bars, that's how many people positive each day. And so you can see now over to the right for, for a bunch of days this last week, we've had more than 100 patients. In fact, our seven day rolling average as of yesterday was 105. It was 52 for the month of October. So it has doubled since the month of October now. Um, and if you look at the orange line, that's what percentage of tests are now positive. That's now 11.6% um, and has been going up dramatically. Uh, let me, uh, for the month of October, it was 6.6%. Um, so that's gone up, uh, you know, not quite double, but getting pretty close. 
uh, and our low point was as low as 3.8% in mid-September. So that is coming up. And you know, you just have to look at that curve versus the curve we saw the last time, and it doesn't take much to say, okay, this could slip out of, out of control here if we're not uh, careful. This is the slide then uh, across the TMC of aggregate hospitalizations across all of the TMC hospitals. Similar trend, you're seeing very significant uptick. This is now a 4.6% seven day, you know, average daily rate of increase. If you do the compounding on that, that's a little over a 15 day doubling. So that would say over the next two weeks, we will see twice as many people admitted. And remember the problem is two weeks after that, that's twice of that. So that's four times what we have today. So we are unfortunately starting to see the potential and the risk of some uh, more exponential like growth. This is our sort of famous daily curve that we watch every single day. And you can see we're actually, you know, 50% higher than that first peak. But that first peak, as I've talked about before, was uh, double a normal flu season, but similar to the bad flu season we had three years ago. So now we're flu and a half um, and, you know, there's no end in sight. This is going up. We are in the midst of the day, you know, 310 patients or so. We ended uh, yesterday with 280, um, up about 50% over an eight or nine day period. So we are very concerned that we hit that inflection point. And again, you see the same data across the TMC, maybe not quite as sharp um, and steep yet. Um, but still, um, that has gone up from 350 patients uh, in the acute care setting, which is where we always see this first, to 550 patients in the acute care setting. Um, so a pretty um, significant uptick. So we are obviously concerned about that. We are furthermore concerned about that with an upcoming holiday seasons, et cetera. And so we'll talk some about that in a few minutes. I'm going to transition into a few of the questions you've asked and try to knit some of the rest of the remarks associated with that. And then I'll come back to our team here with some questions you've been asking today and before uh, of uh, the rest of our presenters here today. So one of the first questions is a very good one that I was asked is, okay, so it's going up, but I, th I thought you said the R, um, you know, which is how many people does each person on average give it to, uh, you know, has been ab above one, but I thought you said, you know, that that was the key thing to watch. And it's really just a mathematical, <clears throat> excuse me, question. So this is the R reported by U2 School of Public Health through this whole disaster. So on the left, you see the uh, kind of native R, so to speak, right? It peaked up in the three and a half range or so. That's before we did anything as a community to start mitigating. We brought it down pretty well. Um, when we got out of control, though, in mid-June, note that the R didn't go up all that high. It got up, depending on the you know, different metrics and different R's that were calculated, maybe one and a half, certainly in that second blip there, which is when things ran so significantly out of control. It was brought down. And in fact, we went for a long period of time. It was really great with an R below one and even significantly below one. And hence we, you know, the Methodist came from almost 800 patients down to a low of 137 patients um, at Methodist. But now look at essentially the whole month of October and into November where we have run above one. And the nature of exponential spread of any sort is it's simple math. And even though 1.1 doesn't sound that high, 1.1 of one is 1.1, and then 1.1 of that is 1.21, and et cetera, and et cetera, et cetera. And eventually it starts accelerating on you. So we've been seeing a lot of ours in the 1.1 to 1.25 range now over you know, almost a two month period. And we kind of keep loading the gun and you know, eventually it starts to get out of our control. And that's exactly what's been happening. So thank you for that great question. Okay, so let's talk about the holidays. Um, obviously, uh, we're a week away from Thanksgiving and it's not gonna be a normal Thanksgiving. Um, flying is happening coming up. So what is our advice around that? Well, let me start with um, a summary of some slide, you know, slide I showed a number of times, which is kind of my five key lessons here. Science, especially biological science is messy in real time, but it's our, we didn't put the other half of it. It's our only real hope. And we'll talk about vaccines um, and the hope that gives and all the other things you've heard about today. Our sacred end, which is caring for patients with COVID, without COVID, caring for our employees, our political leaders working on controlling the disease, protecting the economy, getting children good, high quality education in person, if, if at all possible. But I wanna focus on the last two that I talked about. And that's if we wanna accomplish this as a society, social lives have to take somewhat of a backseat. It's a crappy lesson, it's a crappy thing. 
None of us like it, but it is what it is. And masks are a means to accomplish the sacred hand. And as I've said before, have to be mandatory. I mean, I, it, it just amazes me that we have states, particularly some that are getting really hot right now, that just still won't say how simple is it, is it for everybody to protect each other and wear a mask. So like everything else during COVID, this is a risk benefit analysis and every family has to do their own risk benefit analysis, also thinking about the greater good and us as a society together. So obviously the safest thing to do over a holiday like Thanksgiving is only to celebrate with your household, do something virtually with people uh, away from your household, for instance. That's a risk benefit analysis you need to ask Obviously, if you have high-risk individuals in your family, maybe this is parts of your family that are virtual and parts of your family will talk about other strategies that are together. So think about vulnerabilities. You know, I, I, I don't want to overplay the kind of war analogy, but the, light of the, the light's there at the end of the tunnel. Nobody wants to be the person who dies basically right as the peace treaty is being signed because somebody didn't get the message that, you know, that, that, that the ceasefire had happened. Um, you know, the light's there. If we can be patient and, and uh, work together, we're going to get there. And we're going to get there in a shorter period of time from now, by far, I think, than what we've already been dealing with in this. So assess that risk. The next and middle strategy, you know, may be very effective for families who do want to get together um, and who assess that risk and say, you know, on aggregate, none of us are at high individual risk, but of course we don't want all of us getting the disease. Remember, I, I tell people this all the time, even my kids, my 15 year old, my 21 year old, my 25 year old, I don't want them getting this disease because I don't understand what it's going to do to them five years from now, 10 years from now. And we know with SARS-1, we've seen significant issues downstream. And so I don't believe this is a disease you want to get at all if you can prevent it. So in these situations, create your own bubble. We watched the NBA, for example, do this the best of any sports league. How did the bubble work? Once you entered the bubble and you were tested and you knew you were not 100%, but, but more likely to be safe, you didn't leave the bubble and no one left the bubble and they continued testing throughout that bubble. Now you're talking about you know a, a four day weekend or maybe a day or two over Thanksgiving. So how do you create a bubble? One is, and it should have already started um, and certainly start today if it hadn't, leading up to the bubble, everybody has to be extra, extra cautious, right? You're only gonna be as strong as your weakest link. So everybody's gotta agree they're gonna be extra cautious. As you then work to enter the bubble, get tested. It's available. We've got tons of testing capacity. We'd be happy to help you. You can get tested Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and we'll get you the results so that you, you know, and you just wait for the results before you get with people. Remember though, testing's not perfect. It's not 100% sensitive, even with the great PCR test. I would strongly recommend a PCR, not one of those other tests if you're gonna do that. But also remember, there's still a window where you may not be testable. You know, your travel could have resulted in you getting this. So it's not a golden ticket of throw caution to the wind, um, but it is certainly a, a comfort as you do that. Um, still use common sense when you are together. Try to avoid situations where, you know, everybody is going to get the virus from somebody if there's somebody in the room with that. The least safe, but some people obviously will still do that, is to not do the testing, not create the bubble, but get together. If you choose to do that, um, let's be really careful. So we know what works. The CDC has put that advice up here. Go take a look at the CDC site and others. Celebrate outdoors, if at all possible. We're blessed in Houston to be able to do that. And I think from what I'm looking at, it looks like it's right now, a week out, supposed to be decent weather, certainly a decent temperature uh, next week. Um, you know. Don't share plates, don't pass plates around. Um, try to wear masks if you're gonna be close together with people. Try not to share the kitchen with a million different people, you know, unmasked. You know, just some common sense activities. But most of all, try to limit how many people together and how many different elements of a family coming together. Remember one key point about bubbles though, which I talked about before, because I know a lot of us have kids. We have, you know, teenage kids, uh, college kids, etc. Bubbles are only as effective as their weakest link, and they're only effective if people stay in the bubble. So once you're in the bubble, you stay in the bubble. So, you know, for kids coming home from college or other things like that, if they want to exit the bubble, you can't have everybody else in the bubble. They can't be going out and seeing friends and doing other things if you want to keep that same level of safety. Use your common sense. I think we can get through this holiday safely. Many of you will travel or have people traveling. 
Driving, we know, is safe. If you're in your own car, that's, that's a no-brainer. Um, flying's actually turning out to be pretty safe from everything we see. Um, now, that's with the right cautions. So, um, you know, if you fly, and we've talked about this before, that is a mask, preferably an N95 mask. It's either goggles or a face mask. Uh, and, you know, personally, um, you know, you can drink a bottle of water or something like that, but I'd avoid the rest. I'd wipe down my seat and my tray and other things around me. I'd hunker down with a book or, a, or, or my iPad in a movie, put my headphones on, <laughs> go to sleep, whatever it is, uh, and, uh, you know, get, get to the destination. But, but recognize that you really have to be careful um, throughout that whole process. All right, let's talk about a little bit about treatments. I got some, these are a couple of questions. What are the most promising treatments? Somebody, uh, you know, reflected on the fact that we've, we've had, you know, uh, good death rates. I've shown you some of that, uh, but still far too high, but, uh, but good comparatively um, across Houston Methodist. What are some of our best practices? Do we share those? They're actually available on our website. Um, so to your question here, if had somebody was sick at another hospital and you wanted to kind of see what they're doing and talk over with their clinicians, you're welcome to pull this up. Um, when we send this out, this is uh, kind of the first page of, of a complex uh, uh, you know, protocol that we have in place. At the bottom, you'll see the link there um, and we can easily get that to you there. Let me talk about a couple updates on the treatment side because there's good news here on the monoclonal antibody side. So this, remember when we talked about how excited we were about convalescent plasma, we always saw that as a bridge to getting to monoclonal antibodies. Convalescent plasma gives you antibodies that from somebody else who has uh, recovered, may give you some other things too, um, but kind of in a broad swath basis. Uh, monoclonal antibodies, the idea was to do single or combination cocktails of monoclonal antibodies specifically targeted at much higher rates or higher uh, concentration that you could get from uh, a convalescent plasma. And the original, the initial data is really encouraging. Regeneron, which has only done a press release, we've not seen this peer reviewed yet, uh, basically shows a, a two antibody cocktail in about 275 pa uh, outpatients. Um, what we saw there is it works when you identify high risk people and you give them this in the outpatient setting, and you can cut the rate of hospitalization and emergency room visits substantially. Now, it does mean you have to treat a lot of people to prevent individual hospitalizations because, of course, most people in those groups don't end up hospitalized. What they saw was on the inpatient side was not effective, and so um, really those trials have been terminated. If you look at uh, then Eli Lilly, and this is even farther along, in fact, uh, we'll, we've got a question about it, we'll talk about it. Um, they've studied both a single antibody, um, and that's in the top in 452 patients, as well as a dual antibody cocktail. Both give us really great data. I mean, you're seeing a relative risk you know, of 0.28-ish and even 0.15 meaning you might drive down 85% of hospitalizations that might occur in a high-risk individual if you give this. And they saw really good data in higher-risk uh, individuals. So this is very encouraging. In fact, the top one is bamlanivimab, uh, which is the now uh, approved by EUA uh, monoclonal antibody. Uh, Eli Lilly has worked with the federal government on this. This is just like remdesivir was uh, months ago for us. We are just getting a smattering in. We've gotten about 183 treatments in so far. There's about 5,800 treatments of this. Um, when uh, you look at the state of Texas per week that we expect with a allocation that literally happens each week based on volumes of patients across the state. So unfortunately, it's not going to be widely available initially for every single patient we diagnose, you know, even in a high risk group. So we have protocols in place to allocate this as effectively with the highest chance of helping the most people possible. And of course, we'll get as much as we can as quickly as we can. We've been in these trials from the beginning. So the great thing about coming to Houston Methodist is you know, hopefully we'll get you in the EUA. If we don't get you in the EUA, there's a good chance we can get you in the clinical trial. Now that's a randomized controlled trial. So you 50% chance you get the drug, 50% chance you don't. Um, but again, that's access um, you wouldn't have otherwise. And of course, helping further our understanding of care. And so um, we will do our best to get that uh, to everybody we possibly can. 
So let's talk about the really bright news. That's really good news, by the way. It's just there's not enough of it. We need more, especially with this big surge that's coming. Um, but let's talk about the vaccine. So it's, you know, what about it? Am I going to take it? Is it safe? Um, some concerns people have asked about safety. Um, there's obviously political dialogue around shortcuts and are we going through the right processes and everything else? Share your thoughts on Pfizer. And, uh, you know, how likely is uh, this going to be part of our life in terms of vaccines? So, you know, Dr. Sossman gave me a couple of his slides and I I'm going to be a pale comparison, but, but uh, he and I've spent a lot of time and, and uh, in talking about this and looking at this, we're really optimistic about what we've seen so far. In fact, there's one slide he's shown you before where he looked at different scenarios of what might happen. He gave it a 15% probability that we'd be in the best case scenario. And we seem to be in the best case scenario plus right now. So this is really good news. So here's five leading candidates with the two biggies right now, of course, being, well, first Pfizer, then Moderna, uh, timing wise. Note the left hand column, because I think that's going to prove to be very important. What that says is these these create many multiples of a concentration of antibody or an antibody response in the recipient than we get with convalescent plasma. And so we know these create a very brisk antibody response and a very solid T cell response, the other arm of immunity. Um, so lots of good news on this. Some timings here have slid, but the bottom line is we are on the cusp of seeing those. So let's talk about Pfizer. Pfizer's the biggie right now, right? Pfizer has had uh, over 43,000 people enrolled. What we know so far, and a lot of this is still press release data, so we haven't seen the, 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 the source data yet, um, but very, very good safety profile. They reached a predetermined rate of at least, I think it was slightly lower than this, but they are at 170 infections across those 43,000 people with 95% protection. What that basically says is 95% of those infections happened people in the control arm and 5% of those infections happened you know, roughly in the uh, treatment arm. That's remarkable. They had 10 people with very severe disease. Nine of those happened in the placebo group. So that looks like about 90%, you know, if, again, with small numbers still. But the bottom line is really good results. Very encouraging as they start looking at subgroup analysis appears to really not vary based on age. So we're seeing this in the older population. That was a big unknown. Sometimes with vaccines, it's tougher to vaccinate people who are older. Hence, we have high dose flu vaccine, for instance. Um, that's really good news because, of course, that's a very vulnerable population. No differences across race or ethnicity. So a lot of great news uh, as we look at that um, um, and very excited about that. Moderna is very consistent. And so where we see consistency, that's always a good thing in science as well. They've got more than 30,000 people. Um, they saw uh, uh, just under 100 infections so far, about 95% protection. They had 11 severe cases, not, not dramatically different rate there. Not one of them in their case occurred in the vaccine group. So every single one in the placebo group. So really some tremendous data there. Lots of unknowns still, but tremendously good data. These are both unique mRNA vaccine, so messenger RNA. So they basically hijack essentially the body's own machinery and they give it the genetic instructions to make this spike protein. And then the body revs up and makes antibodies to this. So very novel approach. This is clearly gonna be a proof of concept for uh, this theory. And I think there may be lots of other ways to use that. Now, we don't really fully understand why this is so good, right? Everybody was sitting there saying, well, we'll be glad if we get 50 or 60%. Um, a few hypotheses. It may be that coronavirus is just a pretty easy target. I mean, we have seen that people make big antibody responses to it. So that's definitely a, a, a possibility. There's a, a, at least one theory out there that, you know, uh, and we alluded to before, a number of people may have cross reactivity to other seasonal coronaviruses. That may be one of the reasons we see wide variety in pe people's response. It may be holding back from some of the, the real explosion of care we are, of, of cases we, we uh, are seeing. We don't fully know that, but this may actually be acting as a booster in some people. That is distinctly possible. But it's distinctly possible that this technology is just that good. It is so targeted. So most other vaccine strategies are much less targeted. You're giving a lot of 
you know, either inactivated virus or you're um, giving uh, a, a delivery of an inactive virus with some other virus, many other strategies like that. And this is so targeted in making uh, antibodies to just what we need it to be made to. It could be that, but regardless, it is good news and we're seeing great safety data. Um, both J&J &J and AstraZeneca are moving along well. I would expect in the next couple of months, we'll see them coming through as well. We don't have phase three uh, clinical data on those. We do have phase two um, and um, the AstraZeneca one, I believe it was yesterday uh, reported in one of the major journals in Lancet, uh, actually some things that have been released last month, but the bottom line was it was very effective in older people. Um, and it was actually less, uh, sort of had less side effects in older people, which isn't, isn't real surprising, um, but which is good news as well. So where do we go from here? A um, lot to be done with this, right? We still have a political discourse around this, unfortunately. I will tell you from what I'm seeing, um, the companies are being transparent with their data, not transparent yet to the point that we all have it in our hands, but we will. And as this goes through an EUA, which is a necessity to me during a pandemic, right? I mean, waiting for the normal process, which will take another six or nine plus months easy, is not very logical when we can save so many lives with this and where we have this kind of great safety data. Um, we will look at it um, very quickly internally. And you know, we all are looking at this now saying if, if, if the data are just like this when we see the actual data, it's not gonna be a tough decision for our team to say you know, full speed ahead, protect our people who work here and protect uh, our patients. Um, it's a complicated challenge. Um, uh, uh, the first vaccine coming out, uh, minus 80 to 90 degrees, so ultra cold storage. And we're very well prepared for that. We've got ultra cold storage at most of our hospitals. Um, you know, actually to the credit of Pfizer, these things come in a pizza, it looks like a pizza delivery sort of, you know, the, the, the insulated pizza delivery box. Um, and in that you can get as almost 5,000 doses. Um, and it can actually be stored in there for a good 10 days with some replenishment of dry ice. So even if you don't have the freezer capacity, there's some ways to do this, but we have the freezer capacity. Um, we are teeing up, we are being told we may see this very, very soon. And they are teeing up to have us vaccine either before it's even approved where it would be staged to wait or, or um, very fast follow on that. And so we're very excited about this and expect that in the month of December, there's a high probability we'll start vaccinating our staff. It looks like the first authorizations we will get is to vaccinate frontline staff and perhaps to vaccinate SNF rehab, uh, some of the, the kind of high risk populations in those settings, um, and then the rest will follow. I think it looks like most likely if you're a high risk individual, February, March latest, probably, you're gonna have access to vaccine. It may come before that, but kind of getting through that group um, will probably take from what it looks like about that time. But again, that's still uncertain. Uh, but I'm hopeful that even by April, we may see wide-based availability. And of course, as a Moderna comes out or any of the others, that will amplify those efforts. Um, Pfizer has 1.3 billion doses worldwide. That's 650 million people can be treated in the course of 2021. So, you know, if that's evenly dispersed through that time, um, you know, that's a lot of people each month, um, you know, getting vaccinated. So again, cautiously optimistic about that. So some good news on the horizon. So with that, I'm gonna to transition to uh, some of our other questions and answers. We got a few others and I've seen some others coming in today that we're gonna try and tackle here as well. The first of those I'm gonna to give to, to Dr. Bernard. Can you talk about virus mutations and if you're seeing any mutations in the virus? So um, we continually look at that here and uh, also uh, in the community, uh, scientific community. And there is um, the good news, I think that the the, even though the virus mutates, um, it mutates at a slower rate, and we're really not seeing significant uh, development of dominant strains. And so there may be, in a particular person, there may be a, um, a um, mutation, but it doesn't seem to be you know, providing any advantage to the virus, and so it doesn't uh, proliferate. The one change that we did see was in the spike protein, and it basically became the, the dominant strain that's out there, and it still remains the dominant strain. It doesn't make it, the virus more, um, uh, more lethal. What it does is just apparently allow for a little bit uh, easier spread. And so um, 
uh, the mortality was the same, but the, with that strain as others. So it's there is it, it's not as major a concern as as other. So, so your team or your colleagues have yeah. sequenced, I think, over nine thousand. That's the last uh, number I heard. I know you published yeah. five thousand. Yes, and you saw that kind of dominant spike right. protein and and maybe increasing infectiousness. Um, one of the slides here talked about with the monoclonal antibodies seeing some escape mutants and the possibility of having some some resistance, you know, because of treatment or even right. theoretically with vaccines that get, could happen. So talk about that possibility. Talk about the, uh, uh, the the monitoring we will do because of the thousands and thousands yeah, of it, it is, analyses that we do. It is possible, um, but we haven't seen it. Um, there have been a few that, you know, um, uh, when you model them, it might predict that there was a, a um, strain that, a mutation that was dominant in the, the mink population over in um, Utah in the United States and then in some of the Nordic countries, which led to the slaughter of, of most of the mink. Um, those don't seem to be causing issues. As far as monitoring, we continue to, to sequence as much as we can, as quickly as we can. It's not a simple procedure. I know it's not. Um, and no, it's, I mean, it's, sequencing 9,000 genomes, yeah, yeah, genomes okay. that, that's a big deal. But, but even doing one. Yeah, it, I know, so 9,000 something else. You know, is, and then when you find the mutations, then you have to analyze the computational analysis and whatnot. We have colleagues that do that. Um, Dr. Musser is uniquely positioned through the world to, you know, have his, his worldwide collaborators look at that. There are other tests you can do to see, um, but um, uh, hopefully we won't see any. Uh, we will be able to look for things. But again, even if the antibody production, as you showed on your slide about the different uh, responses, there's still the T-cell immunity. Right. Okay. And so hopefully that'll be um, what uh, people can adopt to and uh, or, or be immune with, but we intend to have, um, if not here, um, access to you know unique patients. If they don't produce antibodies, um, we'll be able to see if we can get them assessed for their T cell immunity. Okay, so I have a second question for you. What's the likelihood of getting COVID again if someone's already had it and recovered? I mean, you you're on yeah. the front lines at the lab, so. You gave those statistics of uh, 27 something thousand right. positives. Some of those were duplicate tests or repeat tests, yeah. right? So 20,000 or so unique individuals. But how often right. have you have you all been seeing people who've been reinfected? It's rare. And so, you know, it's, it's uh, a lot of people are looking for it. And the question always becomes, is it, you know, reactivation or is it reinfection? So there's a lot of criteria with that. You know, they have to be fully recovered. I think, um, you know, there is, if you, the patient is immunocompromised, it's incredibly difficult to, to look at. The, those individuals have been positive for very, very long, 120 days, 130 days. They still have virus detected in them. So if you discount the population, it's still very rare um, and, and we've, you know, we've had maybe two or three where we've thought they might be reinfected in our population here, and we're still not even sure about those. Great, thank you. Well, Dr. Chang, I'm gonna ask you one of the ones that, that came across the wires today, and that really has to do with uh, the vaccine, if, if I may. So the vaccine's out, or soon to be out, soon as we be. talked about. Um, how are we going to convince people who perceive themselves as lower risk? Um, the specific question was around the, the under 50 crowd. How do we convince them to, to get this when they see themselves as perhaps lower risk? Um, and if we don't convince them to do that, how does that impact our herd immunity I, happening? It's all about herd immunity, right? So often, as it is with mask wearing, um, if you think you're at lower risk and you will not get severe disease, that's fine, but you do have a a bubble around you, people around you that you care for, and I often use grandma, right? So um, you really, you know, I think it behooves us to do the right thing, not only for ourselves, but for everybody else around us. Yeah. You know, I, what, there's great data out there to suggest that uh, the most trusted advisors for whether or not to get the vaccine are physicians, physicians and by far, 
Hospital systems are up there, but by far it's physicians. Of course, that's intertwined for us very much. So, so we're going to be working very actively to reassure the public, encourage the public, sure. working with our clinicians across the board. Individual physicians saying to their patients, you should get this. And Absolutely. of course, we want to start with the higher risk population so we can extinguish some of the risk in those high risk populations. But to truly get to where we need to get societally to protect everybody, to protect the 5%, even if this is 95% effective who, in high risk who aren't going to be protected, uh, et cetera, we're, we're going to have to get to herd immunity, which is 60 to 70% under most analyses right now. I think it's doable but it's gonna take a lot of resolve and a lot of hard work to get there, um, for sure. All right, we had a, a question here for me, if budget were no object, what other safety measures would we take to further protect patients from, from contracting the virus while hospitalized? Would we do daily COVID testing of staff? Would we do additional PP? Uh, let me say that, you know, philosophically, um, that's why I joke about this guy to my left being my most expensive. I mean, the answer this year was yes, yes, yes. Whenever <laughs> somebody says, do we, we need budget to do something? I really feel highly confident that we have put in place everything we can put in place that's practical um, to care for patients in the hospital, protect patients from the hospital. And we have not seen, you know, transmission in the hospital to be an issue or a significant issue where we see staff to staff sometimes is guard let down. So it's not, did they have the PPE? It's, did they use it right? Did they, you know, happen to sit in a break room together? Those kinds of things. We do surveillance testing of our staff. Actually, when I survey around the country, most hospital systems don't do that. It's not daily testing. I mean, I think I'd have a revolt on my hands if I was gonna <laughs> stick something in the back of everybody's throat daily. Um, uh, but honestly, I, don't, I think there'd be di very diminishing returns. We have found um, very, very low rate of asymptomatic testing um, you know, during these days of the virus, um, as we all understand how to do protection. So honestly, I think we're in really good shape and I don't think I would change um, too much of what we do. So uh, one more for you, Dr. Bernard. Um, there's been some press out there about you know, high frequency UV light and other things like that, protecting against viruses, it's portable, et cetera. Um, give us your thoughts. Well, the science behind this is the UV irradiation kills things depending upon the dosage, the, the distance that you are away from the, the, between the source and, and the surface that you're looking at and the intensity. And it's actually very difficult to kill uh, with uh, UV irradiation. And um, we, you know, we see these things. Um, I've seen them on TV. Uh, I haven't bought any. And um, it's uh, not something that, um, you know, is highly reliable, highly reproducible. The, the devices are not well controlled when they produce them in the and the light source is, you know, dims as soon as you start to turn it on. So I think you might, you know, struggle to find disinfectant. I mean, yeah. Okay. So you're not a big fan. In other I'm words, not a big fan. Yeah. You know, the, I think it comes back down to some fundamentals and, and we see time and time again, the fundamentals work. It's when we forget about the fundamentals, let our guards down, et cetera, that they don't work as well. So one question that came across the wires, also for me was, you know, how are hospitals paid for COVID? Do we get additional dollars? So the federal government did several things this year. One was they provided coverage for uninsured patients. So when we see an uninsured patient with COVID, they are covered for COVID. That was a great decision because of course, you know, we need a whole population to not fear going to the hospital because they're worried about a bill or other things like that. So we get covered for that, you know, percentage of patients who are uninsured. For all patients who have COVID, we get about 20% more than we would normally get under uh, what's called a DRG or how the federal government pays us. So that's for the Medicare patients, let me be clear. So the government patients that are paid under Medicare. Managed care just pays us regularly. Um, but when we look at the government pay, now remember the government doesn't pay us enough for what they do in the first place. And the 20% doesn't actually get us to even uh, the cost for those individuals, especially when we layer in all the PPE and many other costs. Uh, and you know, furthermore, just the way the craziness of hospital reimbursement, pneumonia and things like that are actually you know big money losing kinds of things. It's surgeries and other things where, where it works out in the basis. So at the end of the day, it's been very helpful. We're really grateful to the government for doing that. Um, 
uh, but it's not a certainly not a dramatic um, driver. The other thing we've gotten is we have gotten um, some support from the feds. Uh, in April, we got sort of all hospitals just got a certain amount. It was kind of an infusion, as, as many hospitals and many other industries did around the country. And then kind of in the May-June time frame, we got some hotspot funding. Um, actually, the last hotspot funding stopped June 10th. Most of our hotspot in Houston was after. So Texas hasn't done too well in the hotspot funding compared to much of the country. Uh, we're doing fine financially. We're well managed. We're, we're solid. We had a brutal spring, um, but things have normalized and settled down and, and we're able to do uh, do well. So appreciate that. And thanks. Thanks for asking. Um, the last question we were asked is, uh, and I always appreciate this question, what can people do to help uh, our staff as they continue to work in the challenging time? You know, we've worked really hard to get people some breathers over the last couple of months as things came down recognizing a high probability that we were going to start seeing the times we're seeing now, you know, it, 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 um, it's frustrating that this is going to happen to our staff who are tired, who more than anybody deserve a great holiday season, time with loved ones and time to settle, you know, to, to relax. And they're going to be working their hardest, um, unfortunately, during these times. So again, the same things I've said before, you know, morale gets boosted when people know that they're doing work with meaning and they know that. But when they're reminded that and the community um, thanks them, you know, props them up, sends them things, sends them thank yous, posts things on, on social media, et cetera, that goes a long distance. We, we were very privileged that um, we've managed to, through this disaster to do acceptably, you know, financially, it's been a tough, tough year for sure. But our priority, I have a board that um, is so supportive of this that we can't do what we do without the best people on the front line. So actually last week we were able to give a very nice bonus to every single one of our uh, employees as a big thank you for everything they've done. I mean, it, we, we planned it to be a week before Thanksgiving. Um, actually, it goes in their paychecks today or they get paid today, but it was announced last week. Boy, it couldn't have come at a better time given the, the hairy time we're entering now. So just keep helping us with that. Thank them. Um, they really do appreciate that. It, it, they, they derive great meaning from what they do. They, they're called to this, um, but it never hurts to be thanked and it never hurts to be kind of propped up. So with all of that, thank you again. Um, I wish you a very safe and happy, uh, albeit a little different, Thanksgiving. As I said, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. The tunnel's a little longer than I'd like but it's coming. And so please be with us, bear with us, be patient. We will be a big part of the solution, obviously, in getting vaccine to the people of Houston as quickly as we possibly can and major priority for our institution. So God bless and happy Thanksgiving. Very good.